I am delighted to be here and I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. I will discuss uh, strategies to mitigate disparities in COVID-19 diagnostics with a focus on the NIH Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics Underserved Population Initiative. Next slide. Next slide. So we know that COVID-19 has, for many people, been the first time they've watched a, a new wave of health disparities unfolding in real time. The previous presenters have done a great job covering racial and ethnic COVID-19 disparities, as well as the problems associated with incomplete data. So let's advance to the next slide. And I'm impressed by Dr. Eisen's model to understand drivers of COVID-19 disparities. And here's a model that I developed to help me conceptualize the interrelated factors that contribute directly to COVID-19 cases and outcomes. The extent data support the hypothesis that each of these factors indeed contribute to health disparities. And the factors in this model can be themed as related to health and healthcare, socioeconomics, and social determinants of health. That is the conditions and the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks, including the risk of, of COVID-19 infection. And this model depicts this backdrop that we can't ignore of structural and systemic racism and discrimination, which a robust body of evidence has documented directly affects health. So a key point is that Disparities in COVID-19 transmission, infection, and death are, are not because racial and ethnic minoritized groups are inherently more susceptible to the virus, but because of social inequities that have led to more pre-existing conditions like heart disease, obesity, diabetes, and other comorbidities, as well as social inequities that increase the likelihood of exposures. Next slide. So with that background and all that of all the previous presenters, I'd like to turn my focus to what NIH has been doing to help. NIH has really been at the forefront of conducting and supporting science around COVID-19 and the noted disparities. When you look across the NIH COVID-19 health disparities efforts, we can think of them as being focused on sort of two buckets addressing key resources and key community concerns. And in addition, they also encourage or require science that applies methods of community engaged research. And both of these are needed to move us to the other side of the pandemic and also you know, to address the, that, the fact that you know, these drivers of health disparities must be attended to with intention. Next slide. So I wanna talk about our RADx uh, underserved population initiative, which is one component of the overall RADx initiative, which was established by Francis Collins. RADx underserved populations is the component for which rather than developing new technologies is focused on already FDA authorized, cleared or approved technologies, diagnostics and applying community engaged research methods to increase access and uptake, and uptake of COVID-19 diagnostics in underserved and vulnerable populations so that they are not left behind. And thus far, RADx up or RADx UP has occurred in two phases. And in just a couple of weeks, we'll have the full launch of the second phase and funding opportunities for phase three will be available within a few months. And the overarching focus is on interventions to reduce COVID-19 health disparities through increasing testing as the primary strategy. Next slide. So here are the three components of RADx Up. They are the testing research projects, the social, ethical, and behavioral implications, or SEBI projects, and the return to school funding opportunity. The testing projects are seeking to expand capacity to test broadly in disproportionately affected populations and to understand factors that contribute to COVID-19 disparities and, and, of course, the implementation of interventions to reduce these disparities. The SEBI projects are designed to inform the implementation of mitigation strategies, including testing and vaccination by addressing, um, understanding and addressing 
the ethical, historical, healthcare, social, economic, as well as overall contextual factors associated with testing access, acceptability, and uptake. And as examples, uh, SEBI projects focus on addressing mistrust and understanding effective communication and messaging. And then we have the return to school projects, which were initiated during the second phase of this, of this work. These are focused on implementing and evaluating testing strategies among faculty, staff, and students to enable at first and now maintain in-person learning safely and in a sustainable way. Next slide. So this effort is one that spans most of the United States. There are RADx subsites in 56 states, ter territories, and the District of Columbia. And this map does not include the newest projects that were just awarded as part of phase two. Now, most of the RADx sub projects are um, engaged with more than one population. And so this figure on the, um, oh, can we back up one? Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, can we go ahead too? Okay, this figure um, illustrates the number of projects who are focused on specified groups, and it illustrates the impressive sort of diversity of this consortium, and which is really, I think, unprecedented in terms of NIH consortia to address health disparities. And this will continue to expand when we include the newest consortium members, but you can see the wide reach of this intervention in terms of, of just the demographics and the geographic locations associated with it. Next slide. So in November, we reached the one year milestone for the launch of RADx Up. And this is an at a glance summary of points to um, point to the progress of this consortium. And with the full launch in phase two, there'll be over now a hundred projects. And the projects thus far have enrolled over 850,000 people and administered over 900,000 tests. We have a RADx Up Coordination and Data Collection Center, which also administers two grant programs, the Community Collaboration Grants um, and the Rapid Research Pilot Grants, and they've awarded nine grants thus far in the Rapid Pilot. We also are um, having more and more scholarly products coming from this initiative. So we're delighted with the um, progress thus far, and we have um, more coming along. Next slide. So we're still re relatively early in this initiative and scholarly products are increasing. Wanna mention findings from two published papers, and this one was focused on the Baltimore area, highlighting the importance of hyper-local data and community-based testing. We know that the national data are incomplete and can miss local community challenges. So this project responded to that, looking at the positivity rate um, among individuals tested in the John Hopkins Health System. And they implemented free community-based testing by partnering with religious leaders and leveraging the skill of trusted community health workers. And what they found, these data were collected last summer and fall. And at that time, they found a positivity rate of 31.5% for Latino persons tested in the community compared with 3.4% among white persons. So the rate among Latino individuals was about 10 times greater. And also among Latino individuals who tested positive versus those who were negative, they were more likely to report Spanish as their preferred language, uh, to be younger and to have a larger household size. So these kinds of studies are important because they help us identify areas for targeted community competent and engaged interventions, which is part of their RADx Up grant. Next slide. So in a second example, um, the pandemic has really compelled the rapid development and implementation of novel diagnostics. And we know that the distribution of self-testing kits or home testing kits is of high interest and has the potential to improve contact tracing if we can get the kits to um, contacts of infected individuals. So in this analysis, uh, they found really high motivation to perform each of the self-testing activities. So most participants overwhelmingly were motivated to distribute self-testing kits to their contacts, were motivated to use a self-test kit to take the test if they were given one from a potentially infected contact, 
And they also found that the motivation to distribute the kits was associated with demographics such as, you know, above average income and completion of college. So I think that, you know, when you think about models of behavior change in the, you know, that motivation is a prerequisite for voluntary behavior. So these kinds of findings suggest that the secondary distribution of self-testing kits may be associated with increased test uptake and case detection, and that perhaps we should focus our efforts on individuals of lower socioeconomic status who may report lower motivation um, to distribute these, these test kits. Next slide. So just a couple of preliminary findings from our return to school effort. These projects have demonstrated, I think, the feasibility and acceptability of COVID-19 testing across settings in multiple populations. Of the projects, um, one of the projects found that after exposure to the virus, there was a 37% increase in access to testing and a 28% decrease in the number of days in quarantine for students and staff to under uh, 10 days. And then among um, data collected before the two major variants of concern that we have, testing and mitigation protocols were associated with low rates of within school transmission. Next slide. Last, I wanna mention a couple of lessons learned. And I think these kind of mirror some of the other comments. And, and that is really the importance of strengthening our relationships with communities, the application of community engaged research methods, which is foundational to Radix Up, requires partnerships, collaboration, negotiation, and a commitment to addressing community needs. We also need to make sure we're flexible, we can adapt, we utilize the input of our partners, and that we connect with health clinics as an important connection to underserved populations. Next slide. And in terms of um, the return to school specific lessons learned, it's really about the importance of framing, framing testing as a school safety measure. This is about health and safety for all, along with other mitigation strategies, working with trusted champions, communicating directly with parents, and engaging with communities about all aspects of testing, um, helping parents work through the various messages to reduce confusion and I think increase understanding. Next slide. Next slide. So just to finally mention that NIH is continuing this work, uh, publishing two RFAs coming up here for phase three. So I encourage you to take a look at them. They'll encourage more research in this area and novel ideas that hadn't been examined previously so that we can continue to address health equity in COVID-19 and, and beyond. Next slide. Thank you.